Hello and welcome to Tales and Trails, I'm Minnie Menon. It is sad that while most of us know where the Mona Lisa is housed, we don't know where the great works of Indian art are. Well, to mark World Heritage Week on LHI, we launched a new series called The Treasures from Our Museums. And you must catch that series online. Meanwhile, I also caught up with Neil McGregor, the former head of the British Museum and the man behind the great initiative, The History of the World in 100 Objects on BBC. Here's a slice of the conversation I had with him at the Tata Lit Live in Mumbai. You know, it's amazing. Uh, a lot of your work, Neil, is based and centered around the idea that you mentioned, that things outlast men. And in many cases, they have multiple lives because they outlast men and they have different uh, realms of relevance uh, that they go through. But we live in an interesting world, and I thought um, after this history lesson, we should uh, you know, start this conversation with the present. We live in a world where we are living in the cloud, quite literally. Everything uh, that we are doing is, is, is captured on the worldwide net. Uh, the world is one like never before, because uh, geographical boundaries have melted. And yet we are putting up walls around each other. So if you had a symbol, and if you were a curator of the British Museum, say 30 years from now, what would be the symbol or the object or the thing that would define us today? Uh, they, well, it would, it would of course have to be something, it is the mobile phone, it has to be the, the mobile phone. Is this, is this on? Yeah. Is this on? Yes, yes. Um, it has to be the mobile phone. Um, because that is what has changed uh, everything. And it's what's changed power as well as communication and everything else. Um, and uh, it, do, it does, you, you mentioned that, that we live in the cloud. It is, of course, it makes me so relieved that um, I'm not responsible for a national library. The nightmare of national librarians now trying to document websites <laughs> at different stages <laughs> and what you collect and when and how do you store it. Um, these questions are enormous. It, that's why things are much, much easier <laughs> and much safer. No, it has to be the mobile phone, without question. Right. But you ended the last uh, history of the world in 100 objects with a solar panel. Did you ever rethink and think that perhaps it was, uh, it was uh, more symbolic to have something like the smartphone? We had a very interesting discussion in the museum about what should be the hundredth of the objects. And obviously, the, the first one of the contenders was the, the mobile phone. But you can't use a mobile phone without power. And what is remarkable about solar energy is that it is changing power relations in the poorest parts of the world. Uh, and that is, that's why we decided ultimately it's more important. Because the, as you know, one of the, uh, one of the uh, ironies or happy ironies of fate is that many of the poorest areas of the world are the ones richest in sunshine. Um, so particularly in Africa, where, the, where we bought our solar panel eventually, or that was made in China, needless to say, um, the, the, what has happened, what that has done, is that solar power has enabled villages to have electricity without the local politicians deciding to give it to them. Mm. And that was a great weapon of control, whether you actually took electricity to the village or not. The solar panel has liberated populations and individuals from the political control of access to electricity. And then, of course, that gives you access to your phone, and that lets you do, that changes the world. But you can't use phones in the poorest parts of the world without solar panels. Okay, the point taken. I, I'm sure there was a lot of debate on this one. But I'm gonna come back to um, the presentation that you gave. What is interesting is that the world is, uh, you know, uh, has come together like never before. I mean, the forces of globalization are evident, especially in the younger generation, and yet never have we been more um, individualistic at one level and more nationalistic. I mean, there is a move politically towards the far right. How do you see these two trends as somebody who's, who's traced the material journey of, of, of human civilization, for instance? How do you see these two very, very diverse parts meeting? Well, of course, I don't understand it. <laughs> but um, I, I think one of the things that is, it's about is the, first of all, the Western European and American particularly focus on the individual and the individual fulfilling themselves 
as an individual rather than as a member of society. That's an enormous shift in the last 50, 60 years. I mean, it's interesting that all the human rights agitation focus of the young in Europe and America is about the right of the individual uh, to be what he or she chooses to be, whether to be he or she even. These are the big debates, not about the kind of community we want to have, not about social justice, economic justice. That's an enormous change. Um, and it's made possible largely because of things like mobile phones. But that atomization of the individual out of society um, is clearly one part of this. The second part is that uh, in all these societies that we've looked at from the past, it's always been critical for the ruler to try to allow the citizens, everyone, to see their image in the society, somehow to find themselves in it. And if it becomes too corrupt, too foreign, too alien, then you lose that identification mm. and it, you retreat into something smaller. So do you think this move far right is a reaction to that? Because we were talking about this uh, before, before the session. And it was interesting that from the Brexit to uh, what uh, Mr. Trump is doing in the US, building walls, or at least threatening to build walls, and what we are doing here in India. I mean, it seems as though there is a comfort in going back to the core. And that really does connect us to the, your new work, which is Living with the Gods. And I know you have a session with Anil later on that, and I'm not going to delve too much into it. But there is a connection over there. I think there's a real connection. I mean, certainly in, in Britain, um, the, 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 the fear of the global world is clearly what led to the, the Brexit vote, to go back to something that people thought was safe and familiar, and a community that they thought they understood, and which they wrongly imagined they can therefore control. But it is, I mean, there is something very frightening about acknowledging this internationalism. It does mean that even a simple object like that shirt, nobody is in control of the production or the distribution of that object. That's, that's very new. <laughs> Right. You know, we'll come back to this theme, but I'm, I'm going to talk to you about how you see India. I mean, the British Library, uh, British Museum has a fantastic collection of Indian, um, Indian artifacts, uh, from the Amravati marbles to, you know, a whole lot of works, the Akbar Nama um, folios. Uh, why did you choose the three pieces that you did for India and the world in, uh, in a hundred, ob in the world? in a hundred objects, because it was Kumara Gupta coin uh, from the Gupta era. It was the Shiva and Parvati, um, uh, you know, uh, sculpture from Odisha, 10th, 11th century, I think. And it was uh, the folio of a Mughal prince uh, 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 bowing his head uh, before a Sufi um, uh, saint uh, from about 1620, I think. Why did you choose these? Um, they were, they all, of course, as you can see, are about the connection between uh, power and faith, and a community of faith, and a political community. And I think that's something that from the very earliest moments of contact has fascinated the British about India. Um, how it was possible for a society, a political to function so well with so many different religious traditions. It's something that Europe has never managed, ever. And when Britain first encountered uh, India in the 16th, 17th centuries, uh, civil war, religious war, was destroying the country and did for a long time, and the whole of Europe. An enormous admiration for a society that had found a different way of doing it. Hence, the great admiration for Akbar above all at that point, um, but not only Akbar, and the desire to understand how this was possible, what the kind of thinking required. The Shiva Parvati uh, statue from Orissa was there because it's very, it was acquired, it was bought uh, in the 1800s by Stuart in uh, Calcutta to put into a museum to show the British the superiority of the Hindu way of thinking. So a very unexpected way of imperial collecting um, and a very, but a very important document of that fascination that the British had with an India that could manage so many religions. It was that idea of tolerance and that the ruler would respect every different religion but not endorse one that uh, I think has always been an ideal uh, 
that the British admired. And it seems to be an ideal that the world needs more now than it has really a, for, a very, for a very long time, as enshrined in the Constitution. Mm, that bowing the head before God happens even now during elections. <laughs> Neil, we have all our politicians yes. going to every religious uh, institution bowing their head. But it's the fact that they go to all of them that's so important. Yeah, but I think that's they're now <laughs> increasingly going to one. But having said which, uh, I think... Uh, it is disturbing. It is disturbing that uh, as a history student myself and as we do um, a, a project uh, like we have undertaken on uh, chronicling Indian history, what is surprising is that when we are going back to our roots, we are going back to our roots in mythology and not necessarily our roots in history. You know, uh, while the Ashoka Chakra is, is our emblem and our object which defines the nation as, as, as it was seen, when we are going back, we're talking about more about Ayodhya and, you know, uh, uh, about Ram and the Mandir. And in some senses, uh, do you think when you look at India as purely as a curator, it's, it's more about faith than, than material history, than, than, than actual factual history? I mean, how do you see it? Uh, I don't think this is a specifically Indian phenomenon. Um, I think this is something that's happening uh, all around the world, not just in terms of religion, but politicians want to present their view of reality. <laughs> um, and that's why history has become extraordinarily important, uh, because history and the examination of things can demonstrate objectively that what politicians are asserting is not true. Um, one if I may, a provincial example about Scottish attempts, uh, political attempts at uh, independence and the Scottish movement for independence. Scottish politicians asserting aspects of Scottish history uh, which are simply not true, but which make a myth. And they're a myth that rally everybody. And one particular example, the Scottish uh, government asked some time ago, for the Lewis chessmen. These are chess pieces made around 1200 uh, and were found on an island off Scotland um, uh, in the 1830s. They were mostly bought by the British Museum, put on show, they're very, very important little diminutive sculptures showing how chess moved from India right the way to Scotland. Um, uh, the Scottish government asserted these were great Scottish objects being held by an imperial government in London and should be returned. What, of course, you can demonstrate perfectly clearly is that these objects were not made in Scotland at all. They were made in Norway um, and had been traded to Scotland. So when the Scottish government suggested that the Lewis chessmen must go home, we did suggest should we return them to Norway, um, <laughs> which was, of course, not the intention. Now, it's trivial and it's small, but it is why historians and museums are so important at the moment. Because in the things is often the objective evidence which can be taken out of the political debate to show what is true and what is not true. Mm, a point well made. But I want to come back to, um, uh, to, the, to the material uh, in India. You know, one of the interesting things in your book and one of the scary things that I felt... Uh, uh, it's almost ominous, is the fact that in, in Living with the Gods, you've said that, you know, uh, in the era of enlightenment, uh, the attempt was made to, uh, you know, uh, create a division between religion and the state. And till 50 years back, we thought the world would be a secular place. We all believed that. And today, it is not. And you believe that, and you have pointed out that the 40,000 year history of man indicates that you can't separate the two. I mean, that sounds scary, especially in the times that we are in. But do you really believe that you can't have these two completely independent of each other? Well, uh, what, I, what I'm arguing is that what communities need, what societies need, is a story that embraces the whole of society across time. Now, most of those stories have been religious ones. Uh, nationalism is another similar story. It's about a group of people across time. People need, communities need a narrative that's about more than the life of the individual and has a bigger dimension and several uh, aims. I think it's quite clear that we need that. Um, you can call that religion, uh, but that's what, I, that's what we're talking about. Um, 
the need for that, for a narrative that embraces everybody and looks to the future, is as strong now as it always was. Again, to go back to Brexit, that is, I think, what has broken in our country, is that the, the narrative doesn't embrace the poor and the left behind, as well as the rich and the, the global. Um, so you need another story which appears to embrace everybody, mm. which, and the national story seemed to offer that. Uh, but for most people, the best established narratives that take us, all of us, through time are the religious narratives. And as the secular ones, communism was an attempt to do exactly that, it has faltered, as other ones have faltered. I think it's not surprising that the faith religious ones have become the only place really where people can find that sense of community through time. Mm. As someone who's been a votary of, of the belief and the very strong belief that the world is one, that we are all connected and you know, your presentation was an example of that. It was about ideas moving and that is the story of human civilization from Atirapakkam, the hand axe to the hand axes that you showed. It was, it was a wave that happened. Are you worried about how this, this uh, uh, you know, the breakup of, of, um, of ideas, of, of nationalism, et cetera, is, is happening right now? Because somewhere, I mean, if you look at the discourse, it's all about you and them. It's never about we. The we is out of the picture at a time when we are, you know, perhaps better connected than ever before. How do you uh, kind of explain this irony? Well, I think you've explained the problem, um, that, and that is the great political question. I mean, ultimately, religious questions and political questions are the same. Who is we? And how do you bring others into the we? Um, and that is the big task for our politicians. Um, in Europe, which uh, I know a little more about, than the, 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 much more than about India, um, in Europe, the great question has been the immigrant question. These very large numbers of people fleeing war and economic oppression in the Middle East and in Africa, wars caused in large measure by that um, 2003 invasion. Um, and only one politician was able to find a language of we, uh, which embraced the immigrants, and that of course was Mrs. Merkel. Uh, only one in the whole continent that could find a language that made a new we. And we all know how that has played out. Um, and I think that's a very serious question. It's a religious question, an ethical question, a political question. And what we need, what the great challenge I think, for all our political leaders, our philosophers, whatever, is to find that language of a global we, which we're really prepared to see through to the end. Mm. As a historian, you also can't take a call on what is happening in the last one year, two years, three years. It takes about 40 years to to understand a trend. So uh, where do you think we are? When do you think we'll make sense of what is happening right now? <laughs> uh, uh, I have no idea. It was George, as we're at a literary festival, uh, it was George Eliot, you may remember, who said that of all human errors, the most unnecessary is prophecy. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> I have no idea where we're going to. <laughs> we no, no idea. So let, let's, let's go on the journey and find out. The last question, and I have to ask you this question, I think uh, depending on politicians to find the we is going to be a little tough because they're all fighting for survival and they're all, you know, in, in, in a zone where they want to create their own empire. So I think that's out of the window. So I think it's, it's more important for every individual to understand the importance of history. And I think that's where I would like to leave this, uh, this conversation because Neil, you've done a fantastic job in getting the young back into the British Museum. I think we saw um, India and the World in Nine Objects, which was again a, a partnership between the National Museum in Delhi, the CSMBS, and the British Museum. And it was really beautiful storytelling which brought in droves of people. Do you think even in the, in the history community, in the museum community, we need to get back to being more inclusive, to getting more people in? Because unless each one of us understands our history, you know, we're going to make the same mistakes. I, I, I agree entirely. And it's why the... the the, the new technologies that was offered, and obviously is what you do on your website uh, about the history of India, um, reaches new kinds of people. It's why, the, why I'm so happy to work with the CSMVS Museum here. Their engagement with a much wider public, an ever bigger public, 
the museums, the thinkers, the writers have to do everything they can to make this for a bigger, bigger public. That's the only way forward. That was Neil McGregor talking to me earlier. Do catch our series, Treasures from Our Museums, only on Live History India. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.